question and see in God's word what happens when our grievances against other believers become more important to us than God's glory. What happens when our grievances against other believers become more important to us than God's glory? Thus, the title of this morning's sermon is Deadly Disunity. Deadly Disunity. Now, as we come to this text, we're coming really to the conclusion of the section that deals with the judge of Jephthah, who's been an interesting character in this book and in God's story, um, certainly in a number of ways. We see that at the beginning of the section on Jephthah, there was a fierce apostasy amongst the people where they devoted themselves to the gods of every direction, and thus Ammonite rule came and led over the people of Gilead, that they were sieged by these enemies and put under their hard oppression. But by God's grace, this led to the people ultimately repenting and turning back to the Lord and God then raising up a ruler, so to speak, um, in the man of Jephthah, who was a mighty warrior. Now, it wasn't quite the same as some of these other ones that were raised up. God didn't call him and then he came, but the people went and sought him and then he answered their Call. Now, he was an interesting man in that he was one who was born of a prostitute and then exiled by his other brothers to a foreign country. But then once things got difficult, they went and called him knowing that he was, in fact, a mighty man. Now, he reluctantly took the role and sat as their leader, their judge over them. And as he did so, the Lord would ultimately give them victory over the Ammonites. After a failed attempt at diplomacy, they went to battle and God gave them into his hand. But as we saw last week, that there would be no enduring dynasty for um, this judge of Jephthah as his daughter would be offered as a sacrifice unto the Lord. And we talked at length about what, how we ought to interpret that text. But it leads us to this final section in chapter 12 of Jephthah this morning as we'll be looking at um, verses 1 through 7. And I appreciated um, as Greg Kite came last week before the sermon um, text was read, he encouraged you all to stand for the reading of God's Word. I'll ask you to do the same. There's good symbolism in that. If you're able, go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. From Judges chapter 12, verses 1 through 7, hear the word of the Lord. It says, The men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites? It did not call us to go with you. We will burn your house over you with fire. Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites, and when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, Are you an Ephraimite? When he said, no, they said, then say Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in the city of Gilead. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. You may be seated and pray with me. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we ask that as we come to your word this morning, you'd give us great insight and understanding of what we are to draw and apply and learn from these seven verses in your inerrant, holy, sufficient book. And Lord, I pray that as we do so, you truly help give us ears to hear um, the warning 
that comes from this section. The warning that should be very striking to our ears of what can happen when we don't seek unity and humility with one another as the children of God. The great bloodshed that can come from that, both literally and spiritually. So Lord, I pray that you would help us in this area. Lord, I pray that you would preserve the unity of this church and help us to be people that fight for that um, as we seek to live faithfully unto you. So Lord, would we learn from this word and would it exalt Christ? It's in his name we pray. Amen. Now, as we work through this section of scripture this morning, we're really going to look at three main points or sections in these seven verses. The first will be the fomenting division in verses one through four, and there's going to be kind of an overlap in these a bit. I'm going to cover four in both of these points, but fomenting division in verses one through four, the civil war in verses really four through six, and then the short-lived rule in verse seven. But we begin by looking at this fomenting division. How do we go from the people of God, these tribes, to the point where at the end of this section, 42,000 of them lie dead at the banks of the Jordan? How did this all happen? How did it escalate this quickly? Well, we see in verse 1 that things got ratcheted up very quickly in this text, but I listen to again what it says in verse 1. It says, the men of Ephraim were called to arms. They crossed the Zaphon and said to Jephthah, why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. The Gilead is on the other side of the Jordan, which is helpful for us to remember the geography of these different tribes as we get into this section, whereas Ephraim is within the territory of the promised land on that side of the Jordan. Now, the Gileadites were not outsiders. It's not right to think of them that way. They were part of the family of Israel. And we see in Joshua 22 that there is actually an altar that was established to mark their unity with the rest of the tribes, even being on the other side of the Jordan River. There was this altar established in Joshua 22 to make sure everyone knew they were still a unified nation, even though they were on the other side of that river. Now, this will be important to the narrative to note that Ephraim has to cross over the Jordan River to come over and confront Gilead. But unlike how Jephthah tried to um, dissuade battle by using reasoning and diplomacy, Ephraim did not take that tactic. We see immediately in this first verse, what did they do? They were called to arms, right? They resorted immediately to the sword. They gathered together and they crossed over in order to confront Gilead. And it's important for us to note here that this was not like a group of 10 guys who came over to bring their grievance against Gilead. We know that from the total deaths in battle, that there was 42,000 at least men who came over in order to confront them. This is a massive group of people coming over, initiating a conflict. So why is this? Why is it 42,000 men are coming now to fight against another tribe of Israel? What is their charge? Why are they so upset? Well, they're claiming that Jephthah and the Gileadites went to battle against the Ammonites without consulting them or recruiting them to join in. That's what's led to this violent mob now that's seeking to act as Antifa would to the tribe of Gilead here. Things escalated very quickly. But if you've been thinking about the story of Judges, this text should have sounded familiar to you. Is this the first time that Ephraim was upset that they didn't get the glory in battle? No, this happened before. So I encourage you to flip with me back a few chapters in Judges to chapter 8. During the time of Gideon, the exact same dispute came against him at the result of battle with the people of Ephraim. Listen to what it says in Judges chapter 8. It says, The men of Ephraim said to him, What is this that you have done to us not to call us when you went to fight against Midian? Sound familiar? And they accused him fiercely. And he said to them, What have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the grapes of the harvest of Abizer?' 
God has given into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. What have I been able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger against him subsided when he said this. So he, at this time, was able to dissuade them from their violent tendencies by saying, no, listen, you actually had a more glorious part of this battle. You shouldn't be upset. And their angers cooled down, and they went on their way. And it's helpful to remember what their point of the battle was that he used to remind them of the glory was that they were able to capture the enemy at the fords of the Jordan and stop them, Okay. So all of that should be running in our minds as we get through the narrative here in chapter 12 because there's a ton of crossover and similarity. Last time, though, they were talked down from their anger. That's not what happened this time. And here, their response is not merely that they're upset. Their conquest here is a desire for both arson and bloodshed. They're showing up with 42,000 armed men saying, we're going to burn your house down on top of you. Okay, the rhetoric amped up pretty quickly in this dispute. Okay, you can understand why the men of Gilead were responded in kind. This was not a mild threat that was lodged against them. So how is it that Jephthah responds? Well, listen in verse 2 and 3. It says, and Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites. And when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? All right, so Jephthah here makes two points in response to these violent charges that are being levied against him and against the people of Gilead. The first he makes is that he declares that their charge is just straight up a bald-faced lie. He says that he did ask for their help and that they never came. All right, that's, the, that's his response. He said, you're upset that we didn't call you. We did call you and you didn't come. Well, what is it that really happened? Well, if you go back to the conflict in chapter 11, verses 22 and 23, it's not clear whether he called them or not. So we just can't say with our Bibles open who is telling the truth here. But what we know is that someone is lying, okay? Both of their testimonies can't be true. He either did call for help and they didn't come, or he never called for help and thus they never come. But somewhere going on in here, there's a liar, and that's partially what's initiating this debate. Now, I think there's good reason to believe that Ephraim is the one who is lying here. It's easy to be courageous once the battle is over, yet cowardly when the fighting is thick. It's easy to say, in hindsight, why didn't you call us? We would have come to your help. While when you're actually called upon, when the fighting's thick, you go, ah, this is your conflict. We're, you know... What, we should stay out of it. This isn't our war, right? I think that's a more plausible um, explanation to what's going on here. But again, we can't be 100% certain just based on what is going on in the text. We don't know for certain. But we do know is that there's lying going on amongst the tribes, and it's going to lead to intense bloodshed. But the second point that Jephthah makes, we know to be certainly true. It is that what it was God who gave the victory into his hand. Whether or not they were called upon, it's clear in the testimony of Scripture that when they went to battle, it was God that gave the victory into his hand, and he reminds them of that here. And this is exactly what's accounted for back in chapter 11. And Jephthah's point here is justified. Why are you coming against me? It wasn't me that won the battle anyways, Right? It was God that won the battle. Why don't you take it up with him? Why aren't you upset with him? He's the one that won. Were the questions that Ephraim should have considered, but they didn't. Why did they not take it up with God? What was going on here? Well, in verse 4, we see that Jephthah and the Gileadites do go to battle against Ephraim, and I will address that more in our second point. But I want to focus on what inspired the men of Gilead to fight against Ephraim. Apparently, Ephraim had told them that, you see at the end of verse 4, you are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. 
So what was Ephraim saying about Jephthah and the Gileadites? He's saying, you're fugitives. You're criminals on the run. This also can be translated as refugees as well. This idea that you don't belong. You're outsiders and you're the ones who have committed an offense. They're calling a very true tribe of Israel, one who they ought to have peace with, criminals and outsiders and making fierce threats against them. They ask you, is this how the family of God is supposed to speak to each other or think of each other? Certainly not a lot of talk of unity going on in their dialogue. Something is dangerously amiss here. But obviously, this was a dispute between different tribes of Israel many, many years ago. But I think it's worth us considering, is there ever disputes amongst God's people today? Do we ever bicker with each other and fight and lie to one another? Fellow covenant members, not only in opposing tribes, but often in the same church body, right? It's worth us asking, what general equity can we learn from this situation? Well, I think there's some basic character principles that had they been applied here would have certainly averted this whole disaster. The first is that they clearly did not humble themselves before confronting their brothers. Do we see any sense in verse 1 that the men of Ephraim prayerfully sought the Lord and humbled themselves before him and then came to make, bring their frustrations known? There's no sense of that whatsoever, right? It's pure emotion and rage and acting upon that, right? They didn't humble themselves whatsoever. And clearly we know by the charge that they made, what were they motivated by? They were motivated by pride. They wanted the glory. That was their charge. They weren't frustrated that the battle had been won. They were frustrated that they didn't get the glory for the victory, and often disputes within the body can be avoided if we will just humble ourselves first before bringing a grievance to a brother or sister. Is it just that our pride got hurt, or is it something more serious than that? God be willing to ask ourselves that. And then as well, we must see in this that there is sometimes good types of pride, right? There's positive senses in which we can talk about pride, like, oh, I'm proud of my kids, or I'm proud of my house, or even I'm proud of our church, right? I think there's a positive way in which you can say that sort of thing. Yet even with these good things, we must acknowledge that our pride can quickly become sour and even corrupted. What about with our own family? How easy is it to become jealous of another family's accomplishments or wealth or blessings? Because you can begin to see their successes as diminishing your own family's successes, and thus you resent them. This is the poison of covetousness, right? They wanted to be the tribe that won the battle. But God didn't call them to be the one that won that battle. What about in the church? Should we have pride in our church? I hope so. But if we have become so proud of our church that we can no longer celebrate the victory of other churches, that be quite dangerous, can't it? Become so resentful that we can't even see good things being done in other bodies? What if another church in town saw a lot of people come to the Lord? Would our immediate response to be, well, I'm sure they were just using carnal methods in order to win them, you know. Probably wasn't of the Lord anyways. I just want to diminish it because we didn't see the victory and so we're going to grumble about it, right? It's easy to do. Or we can just immediately assume that they are false comforts. Well, we'll see if they really stick around. I don't know, right? It's easy to be given over to that kind of spirit. Now, here am I saying that discernment is a bad thing? No, discernment's a good thing. We should exercise discernment. But cynicism is deadly. Discernment is good, but when we're just cynical about the success of others, rather than grateful, certainly other brothers and sisters in Christ as a deadly poison within the body. Within our body and with our family, conflicts will arise. And when that happens, are we going to be willing to humble ourselves in the midst of that? I want to encourage you to get good at asking yourself a few simple questions as conflict starts to arise. The first is, did they sin against me or did I just get my feelings hurt? 
Did they sin against me or did I just get my feelings hurt? So those are two very different things. Now, make no mistake, sometimes sins hurt your feelings. That is true. Sometimes it's both. But it's worth asking the question, are my feelings just hurt or did they sin against me? Now, there's an important note here. Who is the one who defines what is sin and what isn't sin? It's God's word, right? Is it our emotions at any given moment that defines whether something's sinful or not? No, there's an objective standard that we actually have to look to. And thus, if someone upsets you and you, it bothers you and you're saying, is this just my feelings hurt or is it sin? It's important to be able to attach a Bible verse to that sin if you believe they sinned. What did they actually transgress against you? Be able to name that, be able to show them that. That's going to be helpful if you confront them in a godly way. Then it's not just you going to them saying, I didn't like when you did that which is very personal and opinion-based, said, hey, when you did this, I'm looking at this verse. Help me understand this, right? You actually have an objective standard that you can point to. Let me ask you, did Gilead or Jephthah sin against Ephraim? Nowhere in the text of Scripture do we see that, right? Did the tribes of Israel have a duty to call all of the other tribes to battle every time they had a conflict? Is that part of their responsibility before God? No, right? They had no implication to do that. Now, I noted that it's possible maybe Jephthah lied in his response, although we can't prove either way on that. But certainly in the initial charge of just going to battle without consulting them, they made no sin in that. That was no fault of their own if we use God's word as the standard. Second question we should be good at asking ourselves is what role did my actions play in how things went down? If some relationship has been soiled or strained or frustration be put into it, before we initially just start making all the list of their sins, it's good to press pause and go, what was my role in this thing? What what part did I play? I will tell you in doing various counseling of conflicts in the church or in marriages or different things, it's almost never 100% zero. Almost never. Maybe sometimes, but it's very rare. Almost always, we both parties contribute some sort of sin to the matter. Sometimes it's lopsided. But when you don't first address your own sins, you're very rarely going to see a godly resolution to that situation. So be specific. List your sins. Don't rush past them. Make sure you deal with your own contributions. What role did my actions play in how things went down? It's just a reality that we are quick to minimize our own sins and maximize the sins and offenses of others. Have to all be self-aware of that. We always want to downplay our faults, but we're very quick to raise the faults of others. Third question we should ask as these disputes come up is what is going to glorify God the most? How should I respond in such a way that's going to glorify God the most? Do you think Ephraim was asking that question as they marched 42,000 armed men across the river to confront the people of Gilead? What's going to glorify God the most as they're marching to burn down their houses, right? Certainly they weren't asking that question. Very often, I don't think we're asking that question either. I think what often we're asking the question, what will vindicate me the most? That's what we want. We want justice. We want retribution. We never stop to ask, what does God want out of this situation? We must always remember to do that. Jephthah is recounting the strong arm of God to save, and Ephraim is violently raging over their loss of glory. Certainly a stark difference between the two, which leads to what we've already alluded to in the second point, but now let's consider it more, the civil war that goes on really between verses 4 through 6. Did a frame stop and ask those questions that I'm encouraging you to ask in conflict? Reflect on their sins and then turn away from their error? No, they did not. In fact, their fomenting led to one of the first and the bloodiest civil wars in Israel's history. Listen to what happened. Again, beginning reading in verse 4, it says, Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim, and the men of Gilead struck Ephraim. 
because they said, you are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, are you an Ephraimite? And when he said no, they said, then say Shibboleth. And he said Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. All right, so there's a few things going on here that we have to understand on the front end. That Why is it that Gilead responded in the way they did? And why Jephthah respond in the way they did? We certainly looked in the front end of the problem on how Ephraim instigated and fomented this whole thing. But did they respond righteously to it? Well, it's important context for us to flip back to Deuteronomy chapter 17 to understand a bit of what's going on and how they respond in this circumstance. So if you flip in your Bible back to Deuteronomy chapter 17, you might see above verse 8 where it says legal decisions by priest and judges, all right? That's kind of the title that they give for the section. And if you look at Deuteronomy 17, go into verse 12, listen to what it says. The man who acts presumptuously by not obeying the priest who stands to minister there before the Lord your God or the judge, that man shall die. So shall you purge the evil from Israel and all the people shall hear and fear and not act presumptuously again. So under the economy of the old covenant with Israel and with that time, if you were to go against God's anointed judge, that was a sign not only of rebelling against a man or a human leader, but against God's very anointed. And there's a punishment prescribed in God's word for that, for those who would rebel and create insurrection against God's anointed judge that they would certainly fall by the sword, that they would die. That is what's spoken. We see this playing out in the life of David, you might remember. Similarly, Saul was persecuting David and had David on the run and was torturing him in many ways. And Saul was persecuting him violently. And at one point, David had Saul cornered and could have ended the whole thing. You might remember this encounter and had the opportunity to attack him, but refrained. Why is this? Why did David not take the chance in order to get Saul while he was vulnerable? Well, because he was God's anointed. And David knew that if he were to attack him before the right time, it wasn't just him going up against his oppressor, but going up against God himself. If you want to read more about that encounter, look to 1 Samuel chapter 24. But here we see that Ephraim does not have the wisdom of David, and they pay dearly for it. They violently go up against God's anointed judge filled with his spirit, and they will suffer the death penalty before it. Now, it's, I think, helpful for us to realize that this went down fairly quickly. In verse 4, it says, Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim, and the men of Gilead struck Ephraim. Now, I think that King James actually paints a clear image of the initial success that happens here. It says, and the men of Gilead smote Ephraim. Okay, so I think the battle actually was fought and largely won fairly quickly. And then what we read about in verses 5 and 6 is like the remaining few that were on the run. I don't think that all these people were all captured at the Jordan, but rather the battle was largely finished people were on the retreat, and then the cleanup operation is really what happened along the Jordan. I think that's the easiest way to understand it. So the battle was largely won, and the rebels that came to burn down their houses are destroyed. And then what then is the significance of verse 5 and 6? What's going on here? I think what's happening in verse 5 and 6 is actually an incredibly deadly form of irony playing out by God's sovereign hand. Remember back to Judges 8, when Ephraim was upset, not getting the glory for the battle. What was Ephraim's role in that battle? They captured the fords of the Jordan and slew anyone that was trying to cross. Well, now God is turning that very thing right on their head. 
as they are now the ones fleeing, trying to get across the Jordan, now they are the ones who are being slown at the banks. I think there's a divine providential irony going on in these verses. In God's providence, God has now turned their former glory in battle into their own shame and demise. Those who wanted glory and had glory from a previous battle, guess what? Now that's put back upon them as a judgment for being so covetous of the glory of another. This is what's going on here. Those who slew the enemy at the banks of the Jordan are now the ones being slain. But what is going on with this whole shibboleth, sibboleth sort of thing? Now, the meaning of the word shibboleth is not exactly known. If you read a bunch of commentaries, a bunch of people will make their speculations, but it's not clear what this word actually meant in its original context. But what is clear is that the Ephraimites could not pronounce it, okay? Whatever this word means, they couldn't say it correctly, and even our English Bibles point us to that well and that them being spelled a little bit differently, right? They're pronouncing it different. They couldn't say shibboleth, they were saying sibboleth, right? But it's worth noting for us that as we hear that word, that that is a word that's kind of been adopted into our own English parlance to refer to something um, significant for a particular group or sect. It's used in some different ways, but we've kind of adopted that word shibboleth into English, but sometimes we read our meaning of it back into the text without realizing that our language was actually comes out of this text, if that makes sense. And there's so many phrases and words like that in the English language that flow from the story of Scripture. This is just one example of this. But what does this tell us about a frame that they couldn't pronounce this word? They were culturally removed from the other tribes of Israel. They had their own accent and dialect. I think symbolically this shows us their division from the rest of the tribes of Israel. They wanted their own glory and their own culture. I think that's part of what's playing out here. If they had been unified in their belief and speech, this trap wouldn't have worked, would it? But because they were culturally distinct and that was able to be identified, thus they were able to attack them on those means. And as we can see, this goes very poorly for them. 42,000 men would have likely been the majority of their fighting age males. This would have decimated them not just in a battle, but as a people. They wouldn't recover from this really in full for the rest of Scripture. They're, they're marked out um, as being less significant as a result of this. I mean, you think of the cultural impact on just having more kids and that sort of thing. If you wipe out 42,000 of pretty much all the fighting age males of the tribe, they never fully really recovered from that. This was a huge blow to the tribe of Ephraim in the history of Israel. So what do we take from this deadly encounter between two of the tribes? Well, one, I think we must see that it's a deadly thing to set yourself against God's anointed. It's a deadly thing to set yourself against God's anointed. Now, for us, that's not a human king or a human judge or a human general in battle. Who is God's anointed that we are called to follow and submit to? It's the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord who is given all authority in heaven and on earth, the one who lived the perfect life, fulfilling all righteousness, never sinning once, the one who died the substitutionary death on the cross so that our sins might be paid for, the one who went into the grave and rose victoriously from it, the one who ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he now is ruling and reigning. God has an anointed. We must see that it's a deadly thing to set ourselves against God's anointed. He has a judge. It's our job to follow that judge. Are we going to follow? Are we going to rebel against him? Are we going to do that because we want our glory rather than his? There's a lot of connections between their war and our daily struggle as a Christian. Jesus will judge all who rebel against his rule. We must know this. This is certainly true for unbelievers, as, as appointed for every man to die, and after that comes judgment. And they will certainly stand before him. And what is the penalty for those who rebel against 
the one true God's anointed. It's death, right? But an even hor more horrible form of death, not merely at the banks of the Jordan, but what's referred to as the second death, the eternal death, to be under his wrath and hell forever. This is the reality for those who will rebel against the one true anointed judge. We should be warned as well, though, that it will not go well for us as professed Christians if we rebel against God's anointed. These were covenanted people of the family of God who suffered this judgment in this text. We shouldn't merely think because our name is on a church roll or because we are baptized that we cannot face a similar judgment for rejecting God's anointed. It's a grave warning that's found throughout the scriptures. Think of the striking words that Jesus tells to the church of Pergamum in Revelation 2.16. He says, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Speaking to a church there, is unwilling to repent, what will happen? It should be a great warning to us. All who are ultimately found rebels to God's anointed will suffer a much worse death than the Ephraimites. It is deadly to set yourself against God's anointed. Another thing we must see from this account is it's just sad when God's people war against each other. This is the testimony of the people of Israel. They're slaughtering one another to the tune of thousands. And we can talk about whether it's justified or not. I believe it was justified but it doesn't make it any less depressing that this is what the people of God have come to. One of the roles of Israel in the Old Testament was that they were intended to be a light unto the other nations. That by following God, the other nations would see what it is to be in right union with him. Is that their testimony in this encounter? Would our nations want to emulate them at this moment? Whether their attack was justified or not, this whole thing ought to be horribly grievous. I pray that we would have a heavy heart towards any sort of disunity amongst God's people. It should grieve us. One of the things we should pray for and long for is God sanctifies his church, that he would be unifying us more and more. And I certainly believe in this fallen world there's going to be moments of disunity. There's going to be hard circumstances that need to be worked through, right? That's a reality of living in a fallen place. But as God is purifying his bride, certainly as he's sanctifying us corporately as a people, we should pray that he's growing us more and more unified together in speech and thought and action. The son we long for does it grieve us when we see instances where it's not true. And are we willing to personally deal with it in our own life when it crops up? Are we just going to let that disunity simmer under the surface because we would rather not address it? Are we willing to deal with that? Which leads us to our final point, the short-lived rule we see in verse 7. Jephthah is a challenging judge to judge. When called upon to serve by the people, he answered their call. And as he led, he continually sought the Lord, utilized God's word, and gave the Lord the glory for his victories. Yet in spite of these things, there's just a cloud that hangs over his entire reign, isn't there? He is a man from bad origins, the son of a prostitute, who used to run with a bad crowd. He is a man whose heritage was cut off and whose only daughter died a virgin. He is a man who is responsible for fighting Israel's first civil war, which led to the death of 42,000 of his fellow Israelites. And as I've tried to explain throughout, I'm not sure he actually even sinned in any of these things. Yet you cannot deny that his reign is anything but spectacular. And I don't think that is an accident that it ends on such a low note of verse 7. What does it say? Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in the city in Gilead. There's two things I want us to grasp as we're winding up this section. The first is the number of years that he reigned. He reigned for six years. Now, the first part of this that we must grasp is that that's just incredibly short. 
he had an incredibly short reign. And as we're going to see in the book of Judges even more next week, that this sort of short tenure is becoming more and more normative for the people, where they used to have whole generations of peace and prosperity, not only during the judge, but after the judge. Now we're seeing these very quick reigns that quickly come to an end. This is becoming a pattern for the people of Israel. It's a sign of where they're at, I think, spiritually in many senses. But what else about the number six? Well, the number six is symbolic. So we think of the creation account. God created in six days, and then the Sabbath came on the seventh. Six days marks incompletion. It marks being unfinished. It marks failing to enter into that Sabbath rest in many ways, symbolically. So not only is it short, there's a sense in which it's incomplete. No lasting change comes from his rule and certainly no rest for the people. It's worth noting here as well that it doesn't say that he was buried in the place of his fathers as previous judges were stated to have. He was just put into the ground. And again, this is something that you're going to see become normative in some of the other judges we read about. The Sabbath rest of the seventh day never comes symbolically. Jephthah was a savior for Israel, but at the end of his life and reign, there's no question that he was not the savior of Israel. He was a savior, but there's so much lacking from his rule and from his ultimate reign. Whereas our Savior, the anointed one in which we follow, Jesus reigns and brings us into the eternal seventh day. He brings us into that eternal lasting Sabbath rest that only comes through him. And he doesn't just reign for an incomplete amount of time, but Jesus' reign never ends. Jesus' reign does not end in division, but rather Jesus' reign ends in greater and greater and greater climax and unity, not only of his people, but of all creation. Listen to God's word from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, and contrast this with the reign of Jephthah we've been reading about for a number of weeks now, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, listen to this, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Saints, as we conclude our worship, I encourage you to look around the assembly ought to be a picture for us of the unity of our ascended judge and what he is accomplishing. He is reconciling, as we speak, all things in heaven and on earth to himself. And I encourage you, as you consider that reality of what Jesus is doing at the right hand, that you, if you have an issue with someone in the body, it's a serious duty that you resolve it. You're setting yourself against the mission of our ascended Lord. He is in the business right now of reconciling all things. And if you and your life and your actions are contributing to the tearing apart of that thing, you're doing a dangerous thing. Must take that seriously. Must be quick to seek to resolve it. The Lord hates a divided people. Cuts against the very core of our gospel hope and a Savior who is uniting all things to himself through the blood of his cross. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we would be a unified and increasingly unified people, that as you sanctify us, your bride, you would help us to be more and more motivated and driven by seeing your bride hold together strong. Lord, we know that in the sin-cursed world, 
that there will be conflict, there will be moments where that unity is fractured. And Lord, I pray that you would humble us in those moments, that we would be a people that love your glory more than our vindication, that we would be a people that are quick to offer the grace and mercy of the gospel, that we would be judicious as we consider offenses against us. And don't just go by the whim of our emotions, but use your word as our standard. Lord, would you help us in these things? Lord, would you further sanctify your bride? Would you do it all for your glory? It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.